I just love dolls, and I think it is so sweet the way that little girls and big girls pay attention to doll dressing details. We want them to look beautiful from head to toe, and sometimes finding just the right pair of shoes is a challenge. Well, no more. Amy Ryan from Middleton Doll is here to show us how to create shoes that will have your doll stepping out in style. As you all know, lace shaping is one of my favorite techniques in heirloom sewing. Dolls, lace shaping, and many other beautiful things are waiting for us today. I think it's time for us to begin. Welcome to my sewing room. I am so pleased to have as my guest today, Amy Ryan. Amy is a designer for Middleton Doll. Amy, welcome to the show. Thank you. And I'm so happy also to have my friend Joanna here, who is wearing her wonderful little, first of all, she's all dressed up with her pigtails and a pink bow, but she's wearing her adorable little pink and white gingham dress, but especially I'm excited about Joanna's shoes. Amy, these are so precious little white shoes with the pink ribbon and the pink button. And the best part about her shoes is that you made her shoes. Yes. And you can now have doll shoes to match any outfit. Yes. You know, doll shoes are sometimes hard to find, aren't They're they? They're hard to find. And you, if you do it yourself, you can make them any color you want. Oh, I just love it. Okay, Amy, show us how to make doll shoes. Well, the first thing you want to do is look at your doll's feet. So you're, you want to check the bottom of them. And by the, the way, that's Martha's foot over there because that's with Martha red, doll. Yeah. With red hair. <laughs> yeah. you, you're going to check the bottom of the foot and you're also going to look at the top of the foot to see if there's any differences in the, the shape of the foot. Sometimes they're different from each side. Sometimes they'll have a little toe sticking up. Oh, the different size. Yes. Oh, okay. So you have to keep that in consideration when you're working on your pattern. So you're going to actually uh, trace around your, your doll's foot. You're going to get that size and then you also want to add an eighth of an inch around that as ease so that it fits once you're done. And then you want to add another three sixteenths around it and that's your seam allowance. Oh! When you do shoes, you work with very small, small seam allowances. But you add an eighth plus three sixteenths. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what I like to do when I'm first doing a pattern and I'm not sure how it's going to work is to make a two-piece pattern, a heel pattern and a toe pattern. And I'll cut that out. We we'll show them on that finished shoe there what it really is a heel and yes, a, this is. Can you put this, it over there? Yes, this is the the toe part, and then the other pattern is the heel part. Huh. Okay. It helps with fit because you can adjust at the sides here. Uh, I like to take it with no seam allowances and you can drape it over, I'll just show you. You can drape it over the foot before you even start Okay. to see if you have a good fit. So I, I like to do that to check that out. The most important part of the sole is that you want something that's flexible around the edges but then have some uh, firmness to the bottom of it. So. I like to use felt and add interfacing to it. And it's important to have your center toe marked and your heel marked and your two sides where those patterns come together. Okay. Then you also have to cut another piece for the inside to finish it. Uh, another very important thing about shoes is to trim very, very close. So I always stitch twice and then trim a sixteenth of an inch from the edge so that it turns nice and stays and doesn't fray. Okay. But stitching no. twice, it seems like, is important. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, very important. Uh, the, the toe part, you have to ease in so that the toe has some extra room on it. Okay. Uh, and you, you almost always do that. There's never a time that you, you wouldn't do that. It's well, that makes important. sense yeah. when you're going around that curved. Yes. Uh, on this particular shoe, here at the top, there is elastic, and that's that helps you get it on and get it off. Uh, I took ribbon and put elastic to the back and zigzagged it so that you have stretch there. If you don't have stretch on that band, if you wanted to put just a band with a buckle to the side, you're gonna wanna add elastic to the back of the heel. 
Okay, so somewhere you need elastic yes. so that shoe will stay on. Yes. Okay, Amy, that and you put your little button to finish your shoe. Yes. Amy, that is so adorable, and I, I, I said I took Joanna's shoe off. So let me get one more look at this shoe over here. That is so precious. All right, I see that you have ease around the toe. You have your little elastic in the top. Come around with your little decorative button. And since we have elastic, we did not have to, ha right. across the top, we did not have to right. have it in the back. And the adorable little shoe has a sole this time made out of felt, and it's even lined. Amy, this is so exciting to have doll shoes. Yes. Thank you so much for coming with us today. You're welcome. And now we have a so quick, so easy project to share with you. I am so excited about this so quick, so easy project. These are luggage tags, and we're going to call them luggage tags, but actually, you know, diaper bags have to be labeled anytime you take a baby out. Luggage, of course, needs to be labeled. Backpacks for kids at school, even your sewing bags. This is the perfect answer and gifts for everyone. Okay, adorable, adorable. This little teddy bear luggage has a teddy bear embroidered. I'm going to show you exactly how this handle is made. And on the back, there's the child's name that has been embroidered. Or your own name or whoever's name. Now what I'm going to do here to show you exactly how this is put together, I'm going to show you now and then we're going to go through it step by step. I'm going to pull the ribbons out, open it up and let you see that it's the, the bottom piece with the machine embroidery on the front, the name machine embroidered on the back, two eyelets here, two eyelets here and to actually put it on the luggage you're going to fold it in and then run the ribbon through it. Now, I want you to look at this one. I am so excited about it. You might be able to see that has a P on it. And let me turn it over and show you for whom this one is. That says Martha Pullen. And as soon as I finish this show, I'm going to take this and put it on my luggage. Now, let me show you what I'm going to do. When I tie it, I'm not going to just put a simple uh, tie and then a a bow because really I use mine on the airplane. I'm going to come in and do three or four hard knots before I actually put my bow in or actually I could even take a hand sewing needle and be sure I hand tack it too because I want to have my luggage ta uh, tag for a long time. I cannot wait to get that on my suitcase. First, uh, first thing you do, and by the way, this is a brushed denim fabric. First thing you do is go ahead and embroider the name. I'm going to turn this over. Since we used a tearaway stabilizer, I'm going to turn it over to let you see that you will go ahead and take the stabilizer off, except for right around the name. That is brushed denim. The next step is to simply get a piece of the fabric, sew one end down the other, leaving oh, about a quarter of an inch seam allowance, cut it a little bit closer on the edges, and then turn it right side out for your handle. The next step has this wonderful, heavy, flexible stabilizer. In case you haven't used any of this, it's really stiff. It's kind of like cardboard, but it's a heavy, flexible stabilizer. After I turn the handle on, I zigzag it down, zig and zag and zig and zag. This is the basis for my luggage tag, which is really a very, very sturdy one. Then the next thing I'm going to do to both sides is double-sided paper-backed fusible, which, and I will put it on both sides. As you can see, it covers up the zigzag. And then when I'm ready to attach my embroidered pieces, I will simply pull it off and stick them down. Okay, embroidered piece number one is on one side. I, then I still have another side. I will remove the paperback fusible and stick the name down on the second side. This is already done, so I've got the paperback fusible, stuck the name, and also stuck the embroidery. Now I just have two steps left to do to finish this adorable truck uh, luggage tag or diaper, care, diaper bag cover. First of all, to really finish it, I'm going to come all the way around with one or two layers of a heavy zigzag. Goes all the way around the outside. Then to finish the, the handle, I'm going to do eyelet one, eyelet two, eyelet three, eyelet four, and fold it back and run the ribbons through and that is the cutest luggage tag or diaper bag tag or uh, sewing notions, whatever you need to put a name on. And I think our elementary kids would love to have this on their book bags too. And next I have a wonderful technique to share with you. Mm -hmm. 
I absolutely love lace shaping and I love soft knits, especially for night shirts. Can the two be mixed? Oh yes, they can. I'm going to show you how. This adorable night shirt has just a little binding around the neck and this is the softest knit you have ever felt in your life. 100% cotton, of course. And I want you to look at the beautiful loops of lace which are stitched down the front, making it very delicate and pretty. And yes, it's no problem to do lace shaping on knit. The sleeves have the sweetest little uh, French lace around the edge of the sleeves. And if you'll look down at the bottom, the nightgown has, a uh, night shirt rather, has adorable French lace. And all of this is done with a pin stitch. Now, I bet you might have been kind of afraid of doing French lace on, on uh, beautiful cotton knit. Don't be. Here's what you do. The first, and you know I have the loops of lace going down. This is not upside down. The first thing I'm going to do is get this gorgeous knit. I'm going to iron it on, iron on tearaway stabilizer. So the first thing you do is come in and get a piece large enough to completely cover the whole area that we're going to be um, doing our lace shaping on. Be sure it's nice and ironed down. So we have a wonderful stabilizer and then a little bit of lace shaping. Okay, I'm going to do pinless lace shaping, but you can also do pinned. And let me show you a little bit about how you do this, um, the miter that we're gonna come up into the curve, uh, not into the curve, into the corner. All right, if I'm gonna do pinned lace shaping, I'm going to put a pins around the curve and for the miter, I'm going to do a pin at the bottom a pin at the top, I'll try to move my hands out of the way. Then I fold it back on itself. This is all French lace. Fold it back on itself. Remove the bottom pin, which goes through two layers. And look, you will have a perfect miter every time. And then you, I think a lot of you already know about the lace, about the pull thread that's built into French laces. I have a little curve there. So in order to flatten it, I'm gonna have magically pull the French lace and it will be flat. Now I'm gonna show you a little bit about pinless lace shaping because it's kind of fun to do too. First of all, I'm going to, I'm gonna actually straight stitch around this edge. And I'm gonna start over here because when I come, a, come in and straight stitch and pin this. And by the way, when I get to this point, I'll have to fold in that miter. And when I straight stitch around, now remember, this is the first part, so this piece will still be up in the air. I'm going to stitch all the way around. I should have my stick here. I'm going to stitch all the way around, and then I stitch over where the top piece goes over. Straight stitch. All of that can be done pinless. You do not have to put any pins in. Now let me show you what happens. After we get the first row stitched down, what, what, what do we do? We've got to get rid of those ruffles. And the, again, the lace that is built in, the string that is built in, and the one that makes a scallop on the top is the easiest one. Can you see how I'm just pulling that? I, this is just magical to me. I've been doing this for, oh, 26 or 27 years, and every time I pull a piece of French lace, it's just completely magical. Then before the next go round, when you get all the lace down, you're once again going to press that flat. And I already have one that has been pressed flat and actually part of my stitching has been done. One of my favorite stitches to use in heirloom sewing is the wing needle Madeira applique stitch. Or the, it kind of looks like a blanket stitch, but it really isn't. It has a straight edge that goes along the outside of the lace and the little fingers go in and grab the lace. This is a magnificently beautiful stitch. And yes, I am using a wing needle on this wonderful, wonderful butter soft knit. Now, when I come up in the corner, I will finish a stitch pattern and I will turn it around. I will flip it around and go in the next curve. I'm all ready to start down the other side now. One of the things about sewing this Madeira applique or the pin stitch, and it's also called the Point de Paris or the Madeira applique stitch or the pin stitch. So if you hear anyone talking about those three names, you'll know exactly what it looks like. Straight on the top and then the little fingers that go down and grab the lace. And of course, after I finish all of this pin stitching on this wonderful, wonderful knit fabric. Then I will wash away the stabilizer and cut away the fabric from behind to make the lace peekaboo. That's all there is to doing wonderful lace shaping on a fabulously soft knit nighty or night shirt. And now I have some beautiful hand embroidery stitches to share with you.
I am so pleased to have as my guest today my very dear friend Beverly Sheldrick from New Zealand. Beverly has authored several books on needlework and she is a regular contributor to So Beautiful Magazine. Beverly, welcome to the show. Thank you, Martha. It's just great to be back here with you again. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Our pleasure, uh, I can assure you. Um, viewers, today I'm going to do some very simple stitches with you. Um, the first one that I'm going to do is just so simple that it's laughable. If you look here, you will see that I've got these little seed stitches. They really take the place of granitas in a piece of embroidery. I mean, obviously with silk ribbon, we can't do granitas. So this gives the effect of a granita, but it's really just a little straight stitch. And you can see I've got some of them here. It's just a little stitch. It's, n it's just a straight stitch, not pulled in any way. Now, the next thing I'm going to show you is this bow, which is just a slight variation. Most of you are used to seeing me doing that lovely Beverly bow. But this one, because I wanted to put the embroidery in the center and I didn't want to have to do it over the top of the embroidery, then you will see that I've just left this hole in the center. I've just come up and I've just shaped that lace in the usual way. I've knotted it down, not lace, silk ribbon, of course, what am I talking about? <laughs> um, but I've knotted it down with those little French knots. It's, I've used stranded cotton, two strands of stranded cotton. Now the next thing is this rose. And this is a pin rose. And it's really a very pretty little rose, not done very often. I don't really know why, but you can see it's just over and a, a, um, a figure eight over the pin. And then you will see that I've wound the ribbon round it like that. Now I'm going to show you how to do it and it's just so simple, you'll laugh. So here we are. I've got my needle here. You can see I've already done one. I'm just going to pull this through like that but I'm not pulling it tight so it's not hard on the ground. It's just sitting there like that. That was easy, wasn't it? Now, the next thing is you can see here, I've already got started one. I've got the ribbon just lying flat there and I'm just going to take some pins and I'm just going to pin this until I've got a pretty looking bow. One of the beauties, of course, is that if you don't like what you've done, then you can just take the pins out and pin it a little more to what you want to do. Then I'm going to just do little French knots in here, just as you, you know exactly how to do that. So here we are. I want to show you how to do this because this does just takes a little bit of care. So here we are. I've got my pin. Don't be tempted to take too big a bite. You can see there's just a little bite there. So I'm coming over and under and back and there I am. That's all it is for the center. Now you'll see here that I've done just that. I've come, I've already worked that figure eight, but this is the part that you really have to pay attention to. If you fold it, like this, just fold it over like that. Now, when you bring it under this section, you've got to make sure that you get it right in underneath there, Kate, take it right up to where the pin goes in. And then I'm going to come up here like this. You see how I'm twisting it? And again, like this, it just gives that effect of petals. I'm just going to slide that in underneath there like that. And the secret is to not try to get an oval rose. We don't want that. So when I'm doing this winding like this, I'm just sliding it in at the sides like this and then coming round, coming up. Try not to get your pleats in the same place also. Now, once I've got that, I'm just going to take that through to the back like so. And you can see that I've got this one here that I've already done. Now, the secret of this rose is to take some machine thread. You can see that I've got this here. First of all, start in the central section here and come up and then down. And then you're going to come 
up again at the other end here and stitch down. You shouldn't be able to see where you've taken these wee stitches. Now you're just going to work yourself slowly around coming in in all those folds. You can hide your, your those little stitches inside like that. You won't see them. They're hidden in underneath those folds and sometimes you just have to angle your needle and slowly work your way around like this. And you can see how I'm going here. Just going to come down here. I'm going to pull that back a wee bit so it doesn't get caught in the needle. Coming up again like that and coming in like that and over to here and down in there like this and this is the point when you hold your breath <laughs> because you've got to take that pin out and hope that you've got <laughs> everything and this is the moment boom because if you haven't caught everything then it'll just go pop <laughs> and I like to have my needle just ready there so that if I have to, I can quickly do another little stitch. <laughs> oh, the joys of needlework and sewing. <laughs> and I think we probably have all become very good at fixing little blops, don't you? I think we have I can to. speak for myself anyway. Oh, Beverly, those are so beautiful. It is a pretty rose, Martha, and it works beautifully in a seven millimeter ribbon if you want quite a large rose. Now what, what width did you work with? I've, I've used a four millimeter okay. here, oh. but they look good in both. Uh, Beverly, thank you so very much. And You're now I done. have a beautiful piece from my vintage collection to share with you. This is a beautiful christening dress that will be very easy to make today, but it, especially if you had the all over eyelet fabric, very little time involved in making this dress, but it's beautiful. It has the edging and some French lace and some insertions with entredeaux and more French lace and just pretty long sleeves with a little French lace on the bottom. I want you to look at the skirt though. Very, very simple in that it's a piece of eyelet. It's, it's eyelet fabric, not at all. I mean, there's no actual sewing on the skirt except just simply gathering it. Even the bottom edge is finished with this wonderful eyelet fabric. That would be very, very simple to make if you wanted to make a beautiful dress for today. For my sewing from the heart today, I have a letter here uh, from Vicki from Texas. I walked into Cook's Children's Hospital in Fort Worth, Texas, Halloween morning with 50 Halloween pillowcases, which I thought was a pretty good number. The lobby was full of sick children as they were having a party. I saw some children with hair, some without. In wagons, wheelchairs, some pushing their IV poles, they all had a smile on their faces. What an eye opener. I knew that God had led me there to see what I could do for him and these children. I made a commitment that for Christmas I would have a Christmas pillowcase for each child for the month of December. With much help, mission accomplished. I have been sewing for sick children every day since then and have become their stitch coordinator at Cook's Children's Hospital. I like to call our group Stitch a Wish. We all have a common thread to put a, a smile on the sick child's face. Please let your viewers know that children's hospitals use many hand-sewn items and all of you can use your talents to make a little difference in these children's and parents' lives through these difficult times for them. Walk into a children's hospital and look around. Where would you rather be? Helping a sick child or walking around a mall at Christmas time? I think we all know the answer to this. Thank you for all you do for sick children. We can all make a difference in their lives. Vicki from Texas. I thank you so much for joining me in my sewing room today. I surely would like to invite you to come back next time. <laughs>